today, our, our message is going to be one that as I prepared it, it really broke my heart because it's a message of examination. And as I examined a lot of what I examined was devastating. It was sad. It was heartbreaking. And this is a message that as I preach, it could be one of struggle and sadness and despair. But hopefully by the end of it, you will find it to be one that brings you hope, encourages you to love, and ultimately allows you to see victory. See, today as we dive into the word of God, we're, we are going to see a message of just how much the Spirit can move in each and every one of our lives. And so by the end of today, we're going to have the opportunity to examine where we're at, how much Christ means to us, how much does Christ influence who you are. For some of you, it'll be the first time you'll ever be able to examine and say, do I actually have a walk with the Lord? Today's message will be one that, at the end, we will be examining our lives through a spiritual lens, one that can only be seen through the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to invite you to turn to Acts 9 with me, and we're going to take a look at a story of a unique situation, a situation that is one where you and I can learn so much. And it's gonna give us two big takeaways. It's gonna be one takeaway will, will challenge us in where we're at, and the other one will push us to go and do more. And so, in Acts chapter nine, starting in verse 36, it says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, in Greek, her name is Dorcas, which is just an unfortunate name. She, always, she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she, came, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went to them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into your word today, I, I ask that you move my, myself aside and, and preach to us, that I, I am just as receptive to this message as anyone else that we take your words and we take your challenges and we take your knowledge and we learn how to apply them to our lives. But that we leave here not with a checklist of things to do, but with a better understanding of who you are. And through that understanding, we are challenged to become more like you. Lord, I just pray that our hearts are open, our ears are open, and our minds are available to what it is that you have today. Father, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So one of the first things we see with the story is we have a woman who is now passed away. And this isn't like a princess bride type of she's mostly dead. This is a she is all out dead. She is not there. She is gone. And the people are distraught over this. 
The people don't know how to act. The, the widows are crying. They, they are just bawling their eyes out over the fact that they have lost this woman. They have lost Tabitha. She is no longer with them. And they are just distraught. Which leads us to the first real question. Why, why would you be so distraught over losing somebody? Why would, why would Tabitha mean so much to this? We're talking about, in that day, you're talking about a woman who really doesn't have much influence over people. It's just the truth for that day that women don't have the influence. But yet, here we find that she's so influential that they send two men to Peter and say, what do we do? They send two men to the guy who was the religious leader over all of Christianity at the time, and they say, what do we do? We are distraught. We are without hope. We have no idea what we're looking at. Why would people act this way? Why would people be so concerned about losing Tabitha? And the only thing that we can draw from the scripture is that Tabitha is living a life as a true follower of Christ. She's somebody who has not just studied the word and said, oh, okay, well, that's cool. She's become a doer of the word also. In the book of James, James is the brother of Jesus. He tells us to take care of the widows and orphans. And we see that she does that well. We see that she is a woman who is clearly taking care of the widows. When she's gone, Peter arrives, and we see that Peter is greeted by the widows who are holding garments that have been made or given to them from Tabitha. They've been clearly gifted this from Tabitha in some way. However, that doesn't mean that that's all that we're looking at. I mean, it's legitimately telling us that we need to look out for all those that are less fortunate than us. We, we need to be somebody who isn't just looking out for the widows and orphans. Yes, we need to. The Bible straight up says, take care of them. But it's calling us to do so much more than just these two people groups. It's not just saying, hey, only worry about the people who just happen don't have fathers or the people who just don't happen to have, you know, their, their spouse is no longer with them. I dare say Paul's letter to the Roman points, Romans points out to a, a whole different set of people. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 10 tells us how can, how can they believe or how can they uh, call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear if nobody preaches to them? And how can they be preached to if no one is sent? This is something as a Christian weighs on my heart. It weighs on everything that I am because I know there are people around me that struggle because they have not heard. As a missionary that lived overseas and I've seen things where I know that there are people that are just searching for who Christ truly is and it breaks your heart every single day. Especially when they're, for me, they're in my, 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 my Facebook, they're in my Instagram. I see their pictures and it breaks my heart every day. There's an app that you can download on your phone called Joshua Project where it tells you how many unreached people groups there are in the world. And every single day, it'll send you a different people group to pray for. These are people that are so unreached that they, don't, they may not even have the Bible in their language. They have no opportunity to, to hear the gospel. And so a lot of you are probably saying, okay, well, that's not me. I'm not called to go overseas. But you are sent. Every single one of us is sent. Just like Tabitha, you were sent. Tabitha did not move to Lydda. She did not move to this place to, to, to love on widows. Now, this is where she lived. And for you and me, this is, this is the, the, the place that I have been called to work at. These are the hobbies that I enjoy. These are the schools I went to. These are the places I, I, I frequent when I go and eat. For some of you, it may even be your family. You may have been born into a family that is, that is just known as, as heathens. They're, they're known as being, for their debauchery, 
They're known, you may have had the worst parents in the world. They could have beaten you. They could have raped you. They could have done just the most insane things to you. You may have had relatives that are that way. But as a Christian, you're sent to love those that are in your life. You have a calling on your life to go and, and, and preach. You've been sent. Just like Tabitha, you have been sent. One of the last things Jesus tells us before he ascends to heaven is to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize people in his name. See, this is a, a, a passage of scripture that so often is used to tell people that they're sent overseas. This is a passage of scripture that is used to encourage people to go and be missionaries to the Sudan or to uh, Kenya or Eastern Europe or whatever it may be. However, this is so taken out of context when you look at what Jesus is actually telling us. Jesus is saying that my authority, my authority of who I am as God, I'm giving to you to go and preach my name as you're going. See, every single one of us, we, we have a calling on our lives and we've been sent and we've been told to go and make disciples. If you're called overseas, look into it. I highly encourage you to go look into it. You may be called to go live in Romania. You may be called to go and, and live in Iraq. If you are, awesome. But it is no less awesome for the missionary that is called to be a teacher no less awesome for the, the missionary that's called to be a t-shirt printer. No less awesome to be the person who is the CEO of Aflac or the person who is called to be the janitor. You and I have callings on our lives. And it's so much bigger and deeper than what we try to make it out to be. And yeah, we can get weighed down with the minutia of life. And if we let that weigh on ourselves, we can overlook what we're supposed to be doing. We can miss out on our calling. We can miss out on the fact that we're sent. We're called to have this missional lifestyle. I always think of uh, the Blues Brothers. I'm on a mission from God. For those of y'all, I can tell who, how old you are by laughing at that joke. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay to understand that you are on a mission from God. To understand that your life has been changed. That you are called to be a disciple maker. It is okay to understand that you now have the authority from the one who created it all to go and preach his word. Okay, Carter, but what does that look like? What does that actually look like? What, what, why? What, what does this mean? For that, we, we can flip over to Luke 14, and we find a story of Jesus. And he's talking to a large group. And it says, the large crowd were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, this is in, starting in verse 25, it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children... Brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is such a weird passage to read for Christians. This is extremely strange to hear that the God who loves us is calling us to hate. We're called to hate. That doesn't sound right. You'd be right. He's not calling you to hate. He's very overly the top throughout the rest of his teaching isn't calling you to hate people. He didn't come here for you to hate people. We have a God that is so zealous for us, so passionately in love with who we are, that he can't stand the idea of you putting anything in between him and you. 
He wants you to value that relationship to him so much that you, that you loathe anybody's ideas that come between him. He doesn't want you to find somebody else to influence your life. He wants to be the one that you cling to. He's not calling you to hate. He's just saying that in other people's vision of who you are, they're going to see that you love Christ so much that they can't help but think you despise other people. He's saying you need to love Christ. You need to love God so much that other people's opinions of you don't really matter, that, that their value on your life doesn't matter because there's a God who loved everything that was willing to give it all up so that you and I could have a relationship with him. See, it's not about hating the people around us. It's about loving God so much that we can't help but want to bring him glory. Colossians 3.17 tells us whether in word or deed, do it unto the glory of God. And a lot of times in our lives, we find ourselves wrapped up in worrying about the little things that we forget that the things that we're supposed to be doing, we're doing it for a Savior who loves us. We forget that there's a God who was willing to give it all up for us. When we examine our lives, do we let the minutiae get in the way? Do we let the little inconveniences keep us from being disciples for him? Do we value our relationship with God? When you're mowing your lawn, are you praising God for it? Hey, God, thank you so much for this lawn I get to mow. When your car breaks down, do you say, God, thank you for the opportunity to interact with the, with the tow truck or with the mechanic or whatever it is? We have inconveniences in our lives that completely stink, but are we so worried about the things of this earth that we forget to look to God? We have a creator of all things that was willing to give it up for us. Tabitha is simply living this fact out. Tabitha is living out the fact that the little things don't matter anymore. She understands that the gospel is not just a story of a Jesus that took on sin, died, and came back. See, a, a lot of people understand that. They get that. Even the demons in hell get that Jesus died and came back. And salvation comes through that, but it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of you willing to give it all up and follow Christ. See, he can't be your savior without also being your Lord. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German uh, philosopher and theologian during the Nazi regime, called it cheapening salvation. Where we've cheapened salvation to the point that people think that, hey, I just say a prayer and I keep living the life that I'm living. And that's just completely wrong. It's not that you just keep living the life that you were living. When, when you understand what Christ was willing to do for you and you understand exactly what it is that's in your life that is separating you from the Almighty and you understand that's no longer there because there was a Christ that was willing to stand in your place. There was a Christ that was willing to take on the punishment of death so that you and I could have eternity with him. See, we don't understand the differences in eternity. We've, we've cheapened it down to, oh, I go to hell. Hell is an awful place. It's, you know, it's where Satan lives. It's an eternal fire. No, hell is a place where you're separated from love for all eternity. You're separated from all goodness for all eternity. And we miss out on that fact. We lose that there are people around us dying, going to hell every single day. People who never have this opportunity to feel love ever again. See, for Christians, this is the closest we come to hell. For Christians, for us, seeing death around us is the closest we come to hell. However, your coworker, you might be the closest thing to heaven they ever see. So how are you living out your life? 
Is your life one that glorifies God? See, we miss out on this so many times because we we miss out what Jesus was calling us to do. We want to say we want to have a Savior that takes us out of hell, but we don't want a God who's showing us how to live for him. Jesus said in in John's uh, gospel, he tells us, I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. Which is so strange to hear. It's like, well, I love people. I love people all around me. You know, I, I volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. I'll go and I'll, I'll call bingo at a nursing home. I love people. I, I'm an extrovert. I love hanging out with people. I'll talk to anybody. If you're a brick wall, I will stand there and talk to you until you talk back. It's just who I am. I love people. However, does my life say that I'm willing to live sacrificially for those people? Am I willing to go the extra mile so that they understand that it's not just, hey, this is on my way and so I'm going to talk to you? Am I living a life that at the end of it, people are going to look back and say, he gave sacrificially. He lived a life that wasn't like anybody else's. A better question is, would the people in your life miss you the same way they miss Tabitha? See, Tabitha was the gospel to a lot of these people. Tabitha was the closest thing they would ever see to the Holy Spirit. When she lived out her life, she was showing Christ to them. She was showing them who he was. She leaned into the Holy Spirit guiding her. The things that she gave were out of love. These widows understood that Tabitha wasn't just giving them clothes. She understood, they understood that she was loving them sacrificially in a way that Christ would love them. A.W. Tozier, who is a, a philosopher and a writer, and he was a pastor, he has a, a quote that says that the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today. 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would have stopped and everybody would have known. This is such a heartbreaking statement. This is so sad that we have opened up all these places that are filled with great philanthropy projects where we feed people. We, we pass out, you know, gift cards. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes as long as we don't actually have to rely on the Holy Spirit to do it. We'll rely on anything but the Holy Spirit. We'll rely on our own ability. We'll let our emotions dictate who we are. There's a, a Chinese proverb that talks about understanding the difference between truth and understanding how to follow truth or allowing your emotions to dictate where you're going. And the story goes like this. There are three men walking along, the edge of the, tr- uh, walking along the edge of a mountain. The one in the front is known as truth. The one in the middle is known as self. And the one in the back is known as emotion. As long as self is following the truth, it's okay. It can see where the truth steps. It can step where the truth steps. However, the second it turns around, it lets emotion push it along the edge as the second both him and emotion fall to their death. Our churches have become so filled with emotion and not the good kind of emotion that comes from the fact that that, that God is driving you to tears because people are dying around you. But we come in, we, we, we cry, we lift our hands, but it's because we just want to feel. We want to be emotional. But we don't let the truth dictate where that emotion's going. Emotion should be following self all the time. For us, our emotion should not drive us. The truth and the Holy Spirit should dictate everything that you do. I don't think you heard that because I only got this one lady over here who's listening to me. (laughs) We let our emotions push us where we're going. And we do not follow the truth known as the Holy Spirit. 
Think about that in your life. How many times have we had people look at you and go, well, what do you feel like you should be doing? What do you feel like is the right thing? And we let our emotions dictate where we're going and saying, where does God say your value is in him? And how can you make him known to the nations? How can you make the truth known to the people around you? Is it complaining about other coworkers? Is it complaining about your job? Is it complaining about your paycheck? Is it wishing you had a better car or a better neighborhood? Or is it appreciating the gifts that God's given you so that you can glorify him with your actions? You've been put someplace strategically for the calling of God, now act strategically for the truth of God. I'm just as guilty as any of y'all. I wish I had a car that didn't leak oil, but it happens. And I complain about it, and I find myself wallowing in my own self-pity. But that's not where my value is. My value is in the truth of who Christ is. My value is the fact that there was a God that was willing to give it all up and come here and take on all of my sins and my transgressions so that I could have life. Our, stop, our churches have stopped leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit, and thus we have lost the zeal for evangelism and discipleship. One of the examples of this is you can just walk into a church every week, and I'm not, I don't want y'all to hear that I'm saying any of our musicians are bad or anything like that. I love what our, our people do. We have great God-following people up here. However, you can walk into most churches, and you can feel that these people are, are just trying to make you feel something. They're not trying to lead you to Christ and worship. They're trying to drive you to the point where you, you, you just feel broken and you feel sad. We've given up on actually praying to God. We use it as a transition during our, our times of service. Which is one of the saddest things about the church today. If, if you read the Bible, they, they rely on prayer and fasting it means trading in the fleshly desires to lean into who the Holy Spirit is. This year, David Platt, well, every year David Platt does this thing called Secret Church. And it's six hours of Bible study. And it's supposed to represent exactly what the, the, the hidden churches around the world have to go through. They get together and they study the Bible and they pray. A lot of them wish they could have music, but they devote themselves to prayer and study of the Bible. His whole message this year was on prayer and fasting. And as somebody who's Southern Baptist and eats like a Southern Baptist, it really struck a chord with me. I love to eat. I'm a stress eater. I am somebody that when stressful times come, I don't lean into the Holy Spirit. I go to food. Thank you. I'm glad that resounds with somebody else. We all have our own devices, whether that be food, maybe it's drugs and alcohol, maybe it's sex, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's work. Maybe your work is where you find your value. And so you go to work and you say, oh, thank you, God. I don't have to deal with the problems outside of this place. Maybe you get wrapped up in pornography and you're like, hey, I can just pretend that I'm there and I don't have to worry about things around me. Maybe you just don't want to feel, so you drink so much that, hey, if I don't feel it, it's not real. We get to the point where we create all these vices in our lives so that we don't actually have to feel. Our churches have gotten to the point where they're philanthropy houses as opposed to gospel centers and, and places for the hurting to come in and learn truth. I want you to think about your life for a second and don't raise your hand, but how many of you in here could say that there is somebody I am intentionally discipling with my life? Jesus calls us to be disciple makers as we go. There are people who go to church every single week 
But yet they have no desire to tell anybody about who Christ is. Coming to this building does not make you a Christian. I love the people here. Singing songs does not make you a Christian. Giving to the poor does not make you a Christian. Being a good, upstanding citizen of the United States does not make you a Christian. We've traded in real Christianity of following the Holy Spirit for a moral legalism to say, if you do this, it'll make you feel better and you can go to heaven. We've cheapened salvation to the point that we don't tell people you have to follow Christ anymore. We don't tell people that they have to be changed. Your life should look completely different. People should know. Do you pray for opportunities for the gospel to be shown to those around you? Do you want the Holy Spirit to shine out in your life? Or are you wanting to hide it? Are you wanting it to be so low-key that people aren't really rattled when you're around? Are you hoping to keep it on the down low? You know, I go to church. I go to a small group. I volunteer my time. I hope nobody asks me about who Christ is. I hope nobody really challenges what I believe. I hope nobody really asks about why I believe what I believe because I can't give them an answer. We've become so numb to the gospel in our, in our, in our interactions. We've gotten so used to suppressing the Holy Spirit instead of letting it shine. Instead of living for him, we've gotten to the point where we have become focused on just trying to be good, moral people. And all around the United States, there are churches that are closing with great pastors who give a very, very good moral speech every Sunday. And they'll tell their congregation, go and give to the poor. Go and serve with Habitat for Humanity. Go and volunteer with Salvation Army. And at no point do they call their congregation to follow Christ. There are churches that are going to 5,000 a year close because we don't have the respect for the Holy Spirit that he calls us to. Maybe a better question is, does your life naturally bring up the gospel? Are you like what A.W. Tozer talks about? Are, are, are you somebody that if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from your life, 95% of what you do would still go on and no one would notice? <laughs> or is the Holy Spirit so important to you that if it was withdrawn, you wouldn't know what to do? One of the interesting things about Tabitha's story is we don't actually hear of anybody coming to Christ until we are seen, until they show that she has come back from the dead. This is such a calling on Christians. Tabitha's story is one every Christian has. And a lot of you are thinking, well, I've never died never flatlined however the Bible is very clear that through our sins and our transgressions against a God we have died over and over again see we make the mistake of we try and compare ourselves to other people well, I'm not as bad as that dude I've never murdered anyone I'm not as awful as that person. I don't beat my wife. I have a, a great life. You know, I've, I, I do good things. I take care of other people. There are a lot of people who have just been great people who are burning in hell right now because they did not 
put their faith and trust in who Jesus Christ was for them. They did not allow him to be Lord of their life. When our lives are on mission for the gospel, it should be something that naturally proclaims the life of who Christ is. Would the people in your life, would they be distraught that you were gone? Would they be distraught over the fact that their interaction with the Holy Spirit wouldn't exist anymore? Would the people in your life just be dismayed over the fact that there would be nobody for them to show them back to the cross? Our Southern Baptist Convention president, J.D. Greer, has a story of when he was serving overseas. And in the story, he talks about how he made friends with this Southeast Asian man. And it's time for Greer to come home back stateside. And this guy comes to him and he tells him of his vision. He says, I had a vision last night, had a dream. And in this dream, this man's Muslim. He says, I see my entire family in a burning building and I'm walking down this wide road and I see them all walk into this building dying. He said, but I turn around. I see this narrow path. He says, the only person I see standing there is you. Excuse me. He says, you should extend your hand and you say, come with me, I can take you away from this place. Greer says, he looks back at the guy and he says, I can tell you what this means. And he explains the gospel to him. And he says, you know, wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to life. Man it says, but you're leaving today. Who's going to tell my family about this? For us, that's, that's us. There are people that are going to come and go in our friends' lives. And in their lives, they're going to be on a path to destruction. And they're going to be on a path that is, is empty. They're going to be on a path that makes them feel awful. But you're there. Your life is there. You being there is strategic. You being there is to show them the path to Christ. You have the same story Tabitha does. You were dead. You were on the table. You were, there was no life. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are now alive and you are free and you are with him. And you can tell anybody and everybody that story. There's nothing in that story that requires you to know biblical scripture. It is your story. It is your story about how you were sinful and you were dying and you were going to hell. But now you have the opportunity to live with Christ and you have the opportunity to be in paradise forever because God will be there and God is perfect and God is love and God is all things and he loves you and he loves the person in your life that you don't care for. He wants you to become disciple makers. He's called you to be a disciple maker. If we're going to say that we are Christians, we have to become like Tabitha. And we have to love those around us. We have to love the people that are the unlovable ones. We have to love the ones that are, that are our family. We have to love the ones that are the person who annoys you next door, the coworker who talks too much and has a bad laugh. We're called to love every single one of them. And for you and I, this is where the checkup comes for us. When we examine our lives, do you really make a difference without Christ? Is your life influencing those around you in a way that says, heaven is real, hell is real, and I want you to be changed just like I am?
Or do we just not care? We're okay with just existing and knowing that we're going to heaven. Let me put it to you this way. When you understand where you were, when you understand that you were going to hell and now you're not, your life will be so radically different. You can't help but want to tell people. So today, we're about to have an invitation. We're about to have an invitation where you can move however you feel the Spirit's calling you to move. Examine your heart right now. If God's calling you to change for all eternity, do it. Come down front. I'll pray with you. We'll start step one today. Maybe right now you're, you're saying, hey, I've done a really good job of being a moral Christian. I tithe every week. I come to church every week. You know, I go and do mission projects. I read my Bible. I kind of pray. I'm a good moral Christian. But however, when I examine my life, I also see that I'm not really making disciples for him. There's a saying about what a good disciple looks like. A good disciple is one that you can tell where the rabbi's been by the dust that's on the disciple. If somebody looks at your life, can they see the dust particles of Jesus? Can they see where Jesus has been in your life? Can they see that you're radically different? Can they see that your heart just wants them to know who Christ is? Paul tells the people around him, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Could you look at your kids? Could you look at your coworker? Could you look at your neighbor? Could you tell them the same thing? During this invitation, if that's where you're at, don't worry about singing the words. The words are awesome, worship with them. But this is an invitation for you to move. This is an invitation for you to examine your life. This is an invitation that could have ramifications beyond the next 30 minutes and have ramifications for all eternity. And it may not be ramifications on your life. You may already be going to heaven, but this could have ramifications on your children. How are you gonna be a parent? This could have ramifications on your coworker. You're gonna go back to work tomorrow and be the person who does every task to the glory of God? Are you gonna be the kind of person that when you show up to work, you're not gonna complain, you're gonna praise Jesus that you have a job and you're able to take care of the bills? Many people are familiar with the story of Jesus walking on the water. The storms coming up around you and Peter says, if that's truly you, Jesus, call me out on the water. And a lot of Christians have said that, Jesus, if you're real, call me out on the water. And we step out on the water in faith. And we start walking towards Jesus just as Peter did. But then we act just like Peter. And we start looking at the waves and the storms Oh, the bills are coming. The car's not working. The children are sick. Business ain't going too well. My grades aren't the best. And we find ourselves sinking into the sea of despair. But you know what the coolest part of that story is? The cool part, coolest part about that story is not that Peter walked on the water. It's not that Jesus walked on the water. It's that the moment that Peter calls out for help, it says immediately Jesus grabbed him. Today, immediately life can change. Everything can change if you're willing to let it.
if you're willing to allow your life to glorify Christ. Father, just pray for this moment. I pray for the people in this room. I pray for myself. I pray for our churches, Lord. I pray that we become people who are beyond just wanting to be good moral Christians, but that we become people who are truly desiring to follow the Holy Spirit, that we understand that we are radically different than who we were before. Father, I just lift this time up to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As the band sings, don't hesitate. This could be all the difference, not just for you, but for your neighbor, for your children, for your father, your mother. Are you willing to step out right now and glorify Christ?